Alcatraz was built to keep all the rotten eggs in one basket, and I was especially chosen to make sure that the stink from the basket does not escape. Since I've been warden, a few people have tried to escape. Most of them have been recaptured. Those that haven't have been killed or drowned in the bay. No one has ever escaped from Alcatraz, and no one ever will. From the movie Escape from Alcatraz. Welcome back to this week's episode of the Wellhouse Exorcism. This is your ghost of a host with the most, Shanna. It's Pukwa PJ. And this is our final installment of the Alcatraz series. My script is like 13 pages long, so <laughs> we got to get going right away. I actually thought to myself, I'm like, I should read it, but I think my reactions are better when I don't read it. And I, I did a little bit of research. I think that you're making up some really good excuses to not read the script. <laughs> no, I now. deliberately, I <laughs> deliberately made a choice. I'm like, you know what? I'm just gonna let this be natural. Okay, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. My references for this evening are the AlcatrazExperience.com, BOP.gov, Britannica, Gray Line of San Francisco, Exemplar, FBI.gov, FoundFS.org, History.com, Legends of America. Only in your state and Wikipedia. Because why not? <laughs> do you have any? I do. Any? Okay. So uh, I use National Park Services for uh, this week and also a YouTube video called The Prisoners of Alcatraz from Watcher. Oh, okay. Cool. Yes. All right. Well, let's just get right into this because I got 13 pages to get through. Imagine, if you will, a dense fog rolling in. I'm imagining. The sun is impeded, and the air becomes fog. And the air becomes heavy. You cannot see five feet in front of you. Every sound that stems from beyond the fog renders you fearful that your imprisoners are gaining on you. What would happen if you were caught again? This was the case for our next escape. It's a pretty good opening, wasn't it? It was a good opening. Apart from your see, it makes me think of like. <laughs> the heart the, the when you say like the air is heavy all i can think of is like this is california it's like probably hot <laughs> and humid you walk outside and it just feels like you're putting on this wet sweater well it's december Ugh. so no but anyway <laughs> um okay yeah so december that's a different story but. we're gonna go back in time because last week we discussed um the most crazy of all the escapes um yes. but i want to get back on track with the timeline. You know me. Okay. I do have another source. USGhostAdventures.com Of course. They're a good source, actually. They're pretty good. All right. On December 16th, 1937, a dense fog swept through the San Francisco Bay, impeding marine traffic and reducing visibility to near zero on Alcatraz Island. Theodore Cole and Ralph Rowe, two inmates, were working in the mat shop, a routine headcount at 1 p.m. showed all prisoners accounted for. What you doing? Making mats. At the next count... <laughs> I am too! At 1.30 p.m., the two men were gone. Two bars and three heavy glass panes of a window in the shop had a hole 8 and 3 fourths inches high and 18 inches long. Once through the window, they slipped down to the gate of a high wire fence concealed by the fog. With a wrench taken from the tire shop... They forced the gate lock and dropped 20 feet to the beach. Their trail vanished at that point. You know, it's amazing what people can do in desperation. <laughs> I think of Bandit chewing a tiny hole in his kennel in his and getting kennel. out. Yeah. And somehow his body fit through that. Well, anyway, officially, Theodore Cole and Ralph Rowe were the first to disappear from Alcatraz. However, they would not be the first to attempt an escape. A year and a half prior, Joseph Bowers, called criminally insane by his inmates, was serving a 25-year sentence for mail robbery when, one afternoon, while working at the trash incinerator, he tried to scale a fence on the island's edge. After ignoring commands to stop climbing, Bowers was shot by the guards after reaching the top of the fence, falling some 50 to 100 feet to his death. With this recent and bloody botched escape in their recent memory, these two men, so Cole and Roe, attempted to escape from Alcatraz. See, while working in one of the shops, Cole and Rowe had, over a period of time, 
filed their way through the flat iron bars on a window. After climbing through the window, they made their way to the water's edge and disappeared into San Francisco Bay. Prison authorities declared them to have drowned, but four years later, a San Francisco Chronicle reporter reported the men were alive and well in South America. After it was noticed that they were missing, the extensive exhaustive search of the island began, but it revealed nothing. Guards found only the abandoned wrench. Of course, a multi-day search ensued. Portions of the island were even flooded with tear gas in an attempt to flush out the escapees. <laughs> it's like groundhogs or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're coming out the other end. <laughs> in case they were hiding somewhere. But there came no result. Subsequent investigation revealed that Cole and Rowe had prepared for the escape well in advance, using a hacksaw blade to weaken the window bars and disguising the damage with a mixture of grease and shoe polish. Not unlike the major escape we discussed last time with Morris, <laughs> these two men had been meticulous and careful in hiding their purpose. At the beach, the men presumably entered the water, relying on floats improvised from tires or fuel canisters. There was no evidence to suggest they had constructed or launched a raft. Okay. Prison officials concluded that Cole and Rowe drowned shortly after their escape. The reasoning is sensible. The swift ebb tides at the time, estimated at seven to nine knots, would have swept even an expert swimmer out of the bay and into the Pacific Ocean. And as I previously mentioned, the fog was incredibly thick. Even an expert swimmer would be confused as to where they were headed. Added to this, it was late December, so the water would have been very cold, ranging from 46 to 58 degrees. Warden Johnston even said, The water's too cold, the tide running too high, and land is too far. Yeah. Despite their likely fate, police departments in the surrounding counties and the FBI followed up on every tip and rumor. In the ensuing days, months, and years, there were various reports of sightings, but their validity is unknown. Two hitchhikers claimed to have seen Roe and Cole and identified them to police by their photos. A 1941 San Francisco Chronicle report declared that the pair was living in South America, as I mentioned, and a cab driver in Cole's hometown of Seminole, Oklahoma, told police he had been shot by men he recognized as the two escapees. Hmm. These reports and likely sightings would continue for years. So my only thing about that is, you got them being seen by hitchhikers, they're in South America, now they're in Seminole, Oklahoma. They're all over the place, so... It's like Bigfoot. Yeah, you see them everywhere. And nowhere. There's a grainy photograph of one of them walking through the trees. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> Now, there would come other escape attempts in the ensuing years before the famous Battle of Alcatraz. For example, on May 23, 1938, Rufus Franklin, Thomas R. Limerick, and James C. Lucas attempted, and they were sentenced to death for their attempt and the murder of a guard. I, speaking of um, just, like, sentencing and all that, mm -hmm. let's just go back to the one guy being sent to Alcatraz for mail robbery. <laughs> this seems a bit much. I believe there was... I mean, um, it was a felony messing with mail and things like that. Yeah, I want to say, if, if it's one thinking of, he was also, like, um, a Depression-era criminal, and there may have been someone who was hurt and or killed, like manslaughter yeah, may have been a part of some that. some kind of violent crime connected to it. Yeah, I didn't go into that much detail for him, because yeah. his story of falling and being shot to death, I mean, like, <laughs> <laughs> good enough for me. <laughs> anyway, on January 13th, 1939, Arthur Doc Barker... William Martin, Rufus McCain, Henri Young, and Dale Stampill escaped from an isolation unit after sawing through their iron window bars. No surprise, they were quickly caught and Barker and Stampill were shot for refusing. Barker would later die from his injuries. So we already know about Doc Barker, so there's mm -hmm. one though. Now my favorite escape attempt was this one though. It happened on July 31st, 1945, and was done by one John K. Giles. Technically speaking... John Giles did escape off the island. While a prisoner at Alcatraz, Giles's job was to unload dirty army laundry from the loading dock to be cleaned at the penitentiary. One morning at about 10.40 a.m., after spending several years piecing together a uniform resembling a U.S. Army technical sergeant, Giles calmly walked out of the prison and onto an army launch boat under the guise of being a military officer. Almost immediately, things went downhill. <laughs> Officers on it was good on paper. It was. <laughs> Officers on board the army vessel noticed they had one too many men, while a patrolman at Alcatraz's dock noticed one too few convicts. There was also the issue of Giles' uniform. It fit very badly and looked different from those of his fellow officers on board. 
By 11 a.m., he was apprehended and on his way back to the rock. <laughs> just tried... picture him like... <laughs> <laughs> like <Pretty much. laughs> he tried so hard. I mean, he scraped it's Like trying to salute together. to other soldiers and doing it wrong. And <laughs> <laughs> he just took all that time, sewing it all together, and then oof. Trooper. <laughs> Trooper. Trooper. Oh my gosh. <laughs> all right. However, I would like to spend a longer amount of time in 1946. The war is over, as we know. Mm -hmm. But this would be the bloodiest escape attempt that occurred over a three-day period, which would be May 2nd to the 4th of 1946. In this incident, known as the Battle of Alcatraz, six men by the names of Bernard Coy, Joseph Kretzer, Sam Shockley, Clarence Carnes, Marvin Hubbard, and Mirren Thompson took control of the cell house. Overpowering officers and gaining access to weapons and keys, they planned to escape through the recreation yard door. However, when they found they didn't have the key to the outside door, they decided to fight rather than give up. <laughs> oh, crap. <laughs> During the following days, the prisoners killed two of the guards that they had taken hostage. Eventually, Shockley, Thompson, and Carnes returned to their cells, but Coy, Kretzer, and Hubbard continued to fight. Now, how did all this come about? Well, careful planning, of course. So careful <laughs> that they forgot about the key part of Listen, the Listen, there's a reason why. Okay. The escape attempt <laughs> if you was... say so. <laughs> Actually, it's just like bad timing. Oh, okay. The escape attempt was planned by Bernard Coy. Three other convicts were involved in the main plan, and those were Hubbard, Kretzer, and Carnes. Sam Shockley and Mirren Thompson simply joined the escapees after the attempt had begun. On a side note... Coy was a Depression-era criminal who, in 1937, was sentenced to 25 years for bank robbery. He was moved to Alcatraz Federal Penitentiary in 1938 from Atlanta and was soon given the job of cell house orderly, which gave him a relative amount of freedom of movement around the main cell block. Through his role as the cell house orderly, Coy noticed flaws in the prison security. The gun gallery at the west end of the cell house was protected by bars, but with no mesh or barriers. A Federal Bureau of Prisons officer in the gallery had set routines, allowing the convicts to predict when the main cell block and the gallery would be unobserved. So, bars. Like, something that a skinny thing like a rifle would fit through. Why? Is that what he's getting at here? Like, it's that, it's that simple to, like, get a gun? Yes and no. Okay. Yeah, so... Because, um, like, that's a really bad design. No, this actually, like, again, careful planning on the on the case of him here. So the takeover began on May 2nd, as I mentioned. While most convicts and corrections officers were in outside workshops, Coy was in the main cell house sweeping the floor around C Block when kitchen orderly Marvin Hubbard called on Officer William Miller to let him in, as he had just finished cleaning the kitchen. As per protocols... Miller frisked Hubbard for any stolen articles. While this was happening, Coy attacked him from behind, and together, Coy and Hubbard overpowered Officer Miller. After this, they released Joseph Kretzer and Clarence Carnes from their cells. Now that the four were together, they needed guns. The cell house had an elevated gun gallery that was regularly patrolled by an armed officer, whose name was Officer Bert Birch. Terrible name, by the way. Hmm. Burt Birch. It's a fun type. Stan Lee would have used it as a superhero name, though. Should have, yeah. It's alliterative. <laughs> Birch had a routine he followed, and the convicts had attacked Miller while Birch was away. Now, as I previously mentioned, Coy had over the years spotted a flaw in the bars protecting the gun gallery. He realized the space between could be widened using a bar-spreading device. So, Coy spread the bars and squeezed through the widened gap into the vacant gallery. And as another side note, Coy starved himself in order to fit through that space between the widened bars, which was still relatively narrow. That is Dang. how much they planned. Yeah. They, they went through some Christian Bale levels they of did, preparation. Because yeah. <laughs> he's like, okay, I can get it to be that far, but I'll need to be this skinny. So yeah, it's crazy. Any movie buffs out there get that reference? Oh boy. <laughs> he overpowered Birch on his return. Coy kept the Springfield rifle in the gallery and lowered a pistol, keys, several clubs, and gas grenades to his accomplices below. At this point, Coy continued along the gun gallery to enter cell block D, which was used for prisoners kept in isolation. We'll get into cell block D during the haunting section yeah. of this episode. Yeah, that's some messed up stuff. Yeah, it, yeah. He used the rifle to force Officer Cecil Corwin to open the door to the main cell house and let the others in. They released about a dozen convicts, which included Sam Shockley and Mirren Thompson. 
So Shockley and Thompson joined Coy, Carnes, Hubbard, and Kretzer in the main cell house. The other prisoners returned to their cells. They're like, nope. <laughs> <laughs> the gang put guards Miller and Corwin in a cell in C Block. So the next part of their plan was to get the key to the yard door so they could get to the island's dock and get to the prison's launch. They knew the boat came in at about 2.10 and it docked until about 2.30. They planned to use the hostage officers as cover to get to the dock and then off to freedom. The problem was, though, they didn't have the key. Officer Miller had held on to the yard door key against regulations so that he could let out kitchen staff without having to disturb the gallery after lunch. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, oh, that gallery officer, he's at lunch, so I'm not going to bother him, right? Although the escapees eventually found the key by searching the captive officers and the cell in which the prisoners had been placed, the yard door would still not open. See, its lock had jammed as the prisoners had tried several other keys while searching for oh, the correct one. Oh my gosh. <laughs> So, at this point, the escape attempt is foiled. And as it was, the prisoners knew they were now trapped in the cell house. Yeah, and like... It all that's, that, down to a key. Yeah, and it's even worse for William Miller, because he got... He was killed by Joe Kretzer, too, to get the key. And the key didn't work anyways. And uh, there's actually um, two Millers in the story because there's Warden Ed, well, Associate yeah. Warden Ed Miller. Yeah, this is William Miller, yeah. Yeah, there's two Millers, which yeah. gets, gets confusing for some people. So while this was going on, officers kept coming into the cell house as part of their daily routines. Every time they entered, though, they were seized and they were placed in cells. Other officers were sent to investigate when the previous officers failed to report in. They were also seized and placed <laughs> in cells. <laughs> Soon there were nine officers being held in two cells. And we've said they're really small cells meant yeah. for one person. Yeah. So they got nine people between two cells. It's like the uh, clowns in a clown car. Yeah. At the same time, the prisoners were beginning to realize their attempt to flee had massively failed. Instead of giving up, though, they decided to do a shootout. At 2.35 p.m., Coy opened fire at officers in the watchtowers. The alarm was raised when Associate Warden Ed Miller went to the cell, the cell house and was shot at by Coy. So again, at 2.35, the boat's gone. So what are we going to do now? Oh, We're no. We're just going to shoot people. What are we going to do? <laughs> Start shooting people, I guess? Well, funny you should say that. Realizing their plan had failed, Shockley and Thompson told Kretzer to shoot all the officers they held as hostages because, dead, they could not testify against these prisoners. Mm -hmm. Kretzer agreed and opened fire on the officers. He wounded five of them, and one of them, you mentioned William, he was, they called him Bill. Bill Miller would later die because of this. Meanwhile, one okay, of the- Okay, I thought they killed him to get the key. It nope. was later. No. All right, all right. Well, it was a big skirmish anyway. <laughs> yeah. But they would later die, he would later die, as I mentioned, because of that. Meanwhile, one of the officers wrote down the names of all the convicts involved and even circled the names of the ringleaders in case he did not survive. At this point, Carnes, Shockley, and Thompson returned to their cells, knowing the jig was up. <laughs> so they were like, yeah, we're going to leave now. However, Coy, Hubbard, and Kretzer decided they would not surrender, ever. This is when the Battle of Alcatraz would officially begin. At about 6 p.m., a squad of armed officers entered the gun cage, but were shot at by the prisoners. Officer Harold Stites was actually killed by friendly fire, and four other men were wounded. At this point, prison officials cut the electricity to the cell house and decided they would not try to regain control until they had cover of darkness, which is pretty smart. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, but I, I do like that. It's still the first day. It's still May 2nd. We're not even at the third yet. <laughs> now, the U.S. Marines, as I mentioned on the last episode, they were eventually called out to assist, and they were called by Warden Johnston. He's like, I need help. After night fell, two squads of officers entered the prison to locate and rescue the captive officers. At 8 p.m., unarmed officers entered the cell house covered by armed officers in the two gun galleries overhead. They found the hostages. They locked the open door to D-block. When the last officer reached safety, the officers opened a massive barrage from machine guns and grenades on the prisoners within D-block, where the prison authorities thought one of the armed convicts was holed up. They were not. <laughs> They eventually figured out that the rebellious prisoners were confined to the main cell house, and so they seized their attack until further t uh, tactics were worked out. So they wasted a lot of bullets at the wrong place, mm -hmm. but it still sent a message. For sure, <laughs> for sure. But the good news is they did get the uh, officers, so that part's taken care of. Mm. But I mentioned World War II is, you know, 
over by a year. Yes. Okay. Yes. So the tactics of the Marines are going to come from what they know. So the Marines utilized ideas from the World War II leader to corner the prisoners. They got this idea from being a part of the Pacific Theater and getting yeah. the Japanese out. Yeah. I mean, obviously, because you didn't have to worry about that in the European theater. Yeah. It was all Jap- the Pacific Theater. So what did they do? They drilled holes in the prison roof, and they dropped grenades into areas where they believed the convicts were located. And that was to force them into a utility corridor where they could be cornered. On May 3rd, at about 12 a.m., the convicts phoned Johnston to try to discuss a deal. Johnston would only accept their surrender. Kretzer replied that he'd never be taken alive. (laughs) So that (laughs) phone call went very well. Obviously. He's a great hostage negotiator. (laughs) We now have no hostages, but we got the prison. That's why he's the warden. (laughs) (laughs) There's no water unless you bring it, so what are you going to do? Yeah. In less than a week, you'll be begging to come out. (laughs) And Johnston knew that, too. It's like, okay. (laughs) Anyway. Um, That night, the Marines fired a constant fusillade at the cell block until about 9 p.m. So just they waited all day because they knew what's the point. They're going to come out eventually. And they just start shooting at them. (laughs) (laughs) They're coming right for us. (laughs) Just keep them in there. Scare them back. The following morning, squads of armed officers periodically rushed into the cell house, firing repeatedly into the narrow corridor. At 9.40 a.m. on May 4th, they finally entered the corridor and found the bodies of Kretzer, Coy, and Hubbard. With this, the escape attempt ended. So Coy, Kretzer, and Hubbard were killed, and 17 guards and one prisoner were wounded. Shockley, Thompson, and Carnes later stood trial for the officers' deaths, and Shockley and Thompson received the death penalty and were executed in the gas chamber at San Quentin on De- in December of 1948. Carnes, who was just 19 years old at the time, received a second life sentence. I guess they felt bad. So, no. So, that was the famous Battle of Alcatraz. That's nuts. That's like something you'd see out of a movie or TV show. Well, I just, it's the most series of unfortunate events where all we need is the key. <laughs> Everything was meticulously planned, but they I jammed know. the lock. I know. They're so close to being like nonviolent and getting yep. out of there. Yep. But alas. Yeah. And after this, three more escape attempts happened, which includes the crazy famous one we discussed on our last episode. Yep. The final escape attempt, though, would be in 1962. During the last escape from Alcatraz, which was on December 12th, John Paul Scott, who was 35 years old, swam from the island to Fort Point under the southern part of the Golden Gate Bridge, proving to all that it could be done. You could swim Mm -hmm. that far, Mm -hmm. even though so many people would state it could not be done due to the temperature and violent water patterns. Along with another prisoner named Daryl Parker, the pair bent the bars of a kitchen window. Again, these window bars. I know. we got to talk about this. <laughs> they made a pewter? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, um, they bent the bars of a kitchen window in the cell house basement and escaped. Parker was later discovered on a small outcropping of rock a short distance from the island. However, Scott, a better swimmer, made it to the fort point beneath the Golden Gate Bridge. However, he collapsed from exhaustion and hypothermia, and he was soon found by two teenage boys who called for help. He was then taken to the military hospital at the Presidio Army Base. After being treated for shock and hypothermia, he was returned to Alcatraz. I mentioned him. I think it was our first episode Mm -hmm. we mentioned him. But yeah, that's that story just cracks me up. (laughs) Like, hey, we found him. (laughs) That was easy. And he was so close. (laughs) If only he could have just cuddled somewhere and got warm. Uh, yeah, right. If he could have just mustered the strength to go just a little bit farther to hide in a bush or something. <laughs> just hide in a bush. <laughs> Anything. I know, even a trash can. <laughs> Poor guy. All right, so that is the end of all, of all of the escapes that I wanted to discuss. Again, there were 14, but I focused yeah. on the ones that are the most ridiculous. I, I agree. I do like the sergeant one. That one's just... That one's good. That's pretty, I know. (laughs) He tried so hard. Oh boy, anyway. Sarge, what platoon are you with? One. Twelve and a half. (laughs) Funny you should ask. (laughs) How dare you address an officer? (laughs) Be gone with you. Look at this badge. Um, So now I want to move into the haunted island, because that's what we're discussing all this, is Alcatraz Haunted, to kind of finish up our California discussion. Mm Mm-hmm. So, um, I feel like it's Eastern state, same thing. When there's a lot of negative energy, the answer is probably going to be yes. Um, but I want your opinions. I know you have some 
research yeah. on this as well. A little bit, yeah. So due to the nature of blood, anger, attacks, and pain, it would not be surprising to find Alcatraz is actually haunted. The island itself carries a haunted history, as mentioned on previous episodes. The possibility of curses of Native American tribes who believed the island was a place of malevolent spirits already casts a backdrop of bad juju. The Native Americans even warned their people against visiting, lest they be plagued by supernatural disturbances. Some firmly believe that Alcatraz itself is cursed. The island's dark history contributes to the sense that a malevolent force may dwell within its very essence, so regardless of jails or not, only evil can arise on this mountain's top. Now, the first place I want to stop is the island lighthouse, because it's been mentioned in the past mm -hmm. with all of our discussions. Lighthouses are notorious They're creepy. for being haunted places, usually because of their isolationism. Mm -hmm. But I'm curious to hear about this one, because it's not isolated per se. Mm -hmm. The island's lighthouse adds another layer of eerie tales. Its first keeper, James A. King, was found dead under mysterious circumstances, and some believe his spirit still lingers, causing strange noises and unexplained events around the area. Legend has it that the former lighthouse keeper still roams the tower. Visitors have reported seeing a ghostly figure ascending the spiral staircase as if carrying out his duties even in death. Ooh. He complains about people liking his lobster. No, he's looking at the creepy sharks. <laughs> That's what he's doing. <laughs> Look at them man eating sharks out there. <laughs> They're going to get you. He's just watching as the escapees are swimming out like, here he's going to be eating. <laughs> <laughs> he's definitely shark bait. I can tell you, though, a couple of them didn't make it. It's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look at him thrash. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Oh, look at the brains. If you get that reference, <laughs> that is old. a That is a deep cut <laughs> reference. Like even, man, even people who were on the early days of you, well, the internet, that was like a, an obscure part of the internet. If they don't get that reference, Dave, Dave, I want your salad. Your salad. <laughs> I want your salad. If you don't get that reference, okay. it's okay. Anyway. <laughs> So another place that is r reportedly haunted is the strip cell. Oh my. So, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Alcatraz was constructed as a maximum security prison, as we know, where the most dangerous inmates faced a life of minimal privileges. For those daring enough to break the prison's rules, the dreaded strip cell awaited. A place stripped of basic amenities. Like I said, now, now, calm down. <laughs> In this nightmarish isolation... Inmates endured complete darkness, the absence of a sink, a bed devoid of a mattress, and a solitary hole in the ground for their toilet. It is surmised that these dire conditions left an indelible imprint on the souls of many inmates, rendering them unable to find peace even in death. The strip cell was a part of the notorious cell block D and a very scary version of solitary confinement. Mm -hmm. So that is my opening into cell block D, the strip cell. Because there's more than one. Yeah, but cell block D is like... The whole cell block, yeah, it's messed yeah, up. Yeah, that's yep. bad. The notorious cell block D is said to have been and continues to be the most haunted block in all the prison. While first built the same as the other cell blocks, D block, which became known as the treatment unit, soon comprised 42 cells with varying degrees of restrictions. For all prisoners incarcerated in D block, there was no contact with the general population. 36 of the cells were virtually like the others in the general population. However, inmates were not allowed to work nor go to the mess hall for meals. They were allowed only one visit to the recreation yard and two showers each week. And, yeah. And all meals were served in the cells. Their only diversion was reading of prison-approved material. These cells also faced the Golden Gate Bridge, from which fierce cold winds often blew. One guard who worked the D-block was also known to turn on the air conditioning to make it even colder for those confined on the block. Yeah, they were like 30 degrees colder than the rest of the prison. Mm-hmm. Ooh. Yep. Don't like that. Huddle in your corner. Try to stay warm. Five of the remaining six cells in D-block were known as strip cells, but were more often referred to as the hole. Reserved for the most severe offenders of prison rules, these cells were located on the bottom tier, the coldest place in the prison, and contained only a sink, a toilet, and a low wattage light bulb that the guards could turn off. Again, for complete yeah. darkness. Mm -hmm. The prisoners' mattresses were taken away during the day, 
and they were not allowed at any time in the yard or showers or given reading materials. Inmates could be sentenced to as many as 19 days in the hole, completely isolated and in a state of constant boredom. The last strip cell, though, was known as the Oriental, and it was the most severe punishment the prison could assign. Assuring complete deprivation of all peripheral senses, the dark steel encased cell contained no sink or toilet, just a small hole in the floor for the prisoner waste. Yeah, that's the one I always picture when someone mentions D-Block, you know, I, I think of that specific They only cell. had one of those, though. Yeah. <laughs> Um, inmates were placed naked in the cell, given a restricted diet, and confined in a pitch-black cold environment. Although a sleeping mattress was allowed at night, it was removed at dawn each morning. Inmates were usually only subject to this degree of punishment for about one to two days. Yeah. That's all it would take, apparently. Yeah. So now you wonder why it's haunted. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's just like the Klondike from Eastern State. Now, I like to say, as I mentioned before, Alcatraz was haunted before it was haunted, right? Yep. A former guard who worked at the prison in the 1940s reported that guards often saw the ghostly presence of a man dressed in late 1800s prison attire walking the hallway next to the strip cells. On one occasion, when an inmate was locked in the hole, he immediately began to scream that someone was, with glowing eyes was in there with him. The 19th century spectral prisoner had become so much of a practical joke among the guards that the convict's cries of being attacked were ignored. The inmates' screams continued well into the night when they were suddenly replaced by total silence. When the guards inspected the cell the following morning, the convict was found dead with a terrible expression on his face and noticeable handprints around his throat. The autopsy revealed that the strangulation was not self-inflicted. At the time, many believed the inmate was strangled by a guard who had finally had enough of the inmate screaming. <laughs> Just stop talking. <laughs> Be quiet. Shush. Though an investigation was made, no one ever admitted to the strangling. Most believed that the prisoner was killed by the restless, evil spirit of the 19th century prisoner who was often seen wandering the corridors. Adding to this mystery, when the guards had lined up the convicts for a daily count, one too many convicts were in the lineup. At the end of the row appeared the recently strangled convict. As everyone, guards and prisoners alike, looked on in stunned silence, the ghostly figure vanished. Yeah. That's so cool. Right? I mean, it's freaking terrifying, but it's so cool. <laughs> haunted before it was haunted. If only there's DNA evidence back then, because I'd love to, like, know if there was any skin under the guy's fingernails, you know, if he oh, was yeah. attacked by a guard. Mm -hmm. You know, if he tried to, like, claw well, at him. Because there's stories of, you know, people being beaten by by um, oh, yeah. prisoners and stuff. Yeah, so. that's definitely or, not unheard of in a by prison. By the guards, yeah. Well, if you've seen Shawshank Redemption, <laughs> it's a pretty good idea <laughs> uh -huh. what happens. Yeah. But in any case, it was just interesting that, that they all witnessed his ghost, too. Yeah. So, like, again, adds a little little something there. Now, today, if you were to go visit Alcatraz, visitors and staff often report cold spots within the hallways of D-Block, as well as sudden and intense feelings. Cells 12 and 14-D are the most active. Yeah, 14-D is the the one with yep. no amenities, no sink, just the whole... Yep, it's uh, often reported to be almost 20 degrees colder than the rest of the cells in the block, and numerous psychics have felt emotionally charged impressions in the corners of the cells where punished prisoners were known to have crouched and suffered. These cells are so eerie that it is said that some park rangers refuse to go in there alone. Hmm. Yeah, because you have this weird dichotomy with the National Park Service where half of them say that place is incredibly haunted, the other half is like, nah. That's like Eastern State when we were there, you yeah. know? I think you're right, though. They're not allowed people... to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, I think some people just naturally, as you say, like, you know... What's the Repel, Repel ghosts, yeah. yeah. Like, so... some people will go all their lives and never see one yeah. just because of something about them. Their aura, if you believe in that, or yeah. whatever, you know? Now, as mentioned, 14D is permeated by a perpetual chill. One inmate, Roof McCain, was confined there for over three years after an escape attempt. Shortly after being released from the hole, he stabbed another inmate to death and was acquitted on the grounds <laughs> that Cell D had done irreparable damage to his psyche. Hmm. Right? Yeah. 
I mean, you can't deny that, really, when you think about mm -hmm. it. Yeah. Now, when authors Richard Weiner and Nancy Osborne, authors of the book Haunted Houses, made a trip to Alcatraz, they also felt eerie feelings in cell 14D. When the pair entered the cell along with the park ranger, they all felt strong vibrations and tingling sensations in their hands and arms. Convinced mm. that something or someone was there with them, Osborne stated that she had never felt so much psychic energy in one spot. Okay. And then co-author of the book Haunted Alcatraz, Michael Corey, also described receiving psychic impressions when he visited cell 14D. He also experienced tingling sensations, and he saw a small man with his head shaved, and this small man told the story of how he was beaten, his legs broken by the guards, and that he was left in solitary confinement. Hmm. Imagine talking to a ghost like that. Yeah. Now, on another occasion, renowned ghost hunter Richard Sennett and a psychic spent the night on Alcatraz. Sennett locked himself in cell 12D, where an evil spirit is said to make his home. As the steel door was closed, the ghost hunter felt icy fingers wrap around his neck while he experienced psychic visions of the bodies of twisted and dismembered men. Hmm. I don't like that at all. Can you <laughs> He's imagine? He's getting a back massage. Yeah. Who wants a back massage? Boogie, boogie, boogie. <laughs> So then we move on to A, B, and C cell blocks. I don't mean to lump them all together, but it's kind of important that D is like the most horrifying. So Yeah. So we cannot ignore the other cell blocks of Alcatraz, which are A, B, and C. Many visitors have attested to hearing unnerving sounds of moaning and crying emanating from these blocks, where some of the prison's most notorious inmates were once confined. Employees have heard mysterious screams, running footsteps, and loud crashing sounds there as well. Among the eerie tales associated with this area is the presence of the Alcatraz ghost known as the Butcher. Legend has it that the Butcher met a gruesome end within these very walls in the 1940s. One famous story happened in 1984, and that was with Ranger and Night Watchman Rex Norman. He was awakened by the sound of a weighty steel door swinging wildly in cell block C. The sound stopped when he got there, but began again the next night, and the next, and the next. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so on September 10th, 1984, the park system brought psychic Sylvia Brown to Alcatraz. Oh, so, okay. Yeah, I know. Uh -huh, I'm, I I'm know. bracing myself. But Accompanied by a CBS News team, Brown identified the troublemaking ghost as Butcher Malkovich, a hitman who had been killed by another prisoner in the laundry room. During a seance, Brown tried to convince the butcher's ghost to leave the prison, but the ghost refused. And in that story, too, apparently they were with a former, a former prisoner, and he's like, no, that story is 100% legit. Like, that, no. he, he got killed in the laundry room. Like, so the former prisoner was, like, freaked out because, like, <laughs> no one really knew that, and this girl yeah. was just bringing up. So, like, yeah, I roll my eyes at Sylvia Brown, but I'm also kind of like, all right, that's kind of cool. Yeah. My my mom was a huge fan of Sylvia Brown. Every time she was on Oprah, <laughs> my mom w recorded it, and we, you know we watched it, and we were amazed by it and everything by her. She was in an episode of Unsolved, well, several episodes of Unsolved Mysteries. One was about a she ghost. She couldn't solve the mystery. Yeah, actually, she did for one of them. Oh, okay. There cool. was a ghost haunting a Toys R Us. Okay. Because it was built on top of land where he killed himself, well, accidentally, by chopping wood, and the axe hit hmm. his leg and severed an artery. And so he just started uh, haunting this Toys R Us that was built on his property, and she sent him away. <laughs> She'd send him to the light. He's like, I, cut, I hurt myself, so now I'm going to haunt this Toys R Us. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, he was like, why are these people here, and why, like, yeah, what is yeah, this monstrosity <laughs> on my land? <laughs> why are all these children running around? <laughs> Oh, but yeah, we, or at least I know that my mother stopped watching her when she met a woman, uh, like it was on like inside edition, I think it was. And the woman's like, can you tell me anything about you? And she's like, you lost someone very close to you. And she goes, no, you pronounced me dead 20 years ago. <laughs> and she's like, my parents never gave up on searching for me, and they found me. Thank you. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Oof. And she's like, you told my parents to give up. <laughs> and that's when my parents were like, yeah, we're not listening to her anymore. <laughs> Oof. All right, well. If you win some, you lose some. Yeah, right. <laughs> 
<laughs> All right. Well, anyway, in the old hospital ward, park personnel have often heard voices and the screams of inmates who were secured to a table until they were calmed down. Voices are also heard in the old mess hall. And how about good old Al Capone, eh? Oh, uh, Al Capone. Yes. Yeah, so when Al Capone was imprisoned at Alcatraz, he was assigned to a cell located on the outer west end of cell block B. But the gangster was never allowed a musical instrument or a radio, as we know, because mm-hmm. Warden Johnston did not care who he was. <laughs> Many people have reported the sound of phantom banjo music yeah. strumming within his cell. Well, in, in death, you keep what you love, I guess. Did he like banjo music? I think he played. Oh. Yeah. I think he played the banjo. Well, in any case, I have no interest in listening to banjo music, so <laughs> you can keep it. Unless it's the Hitchhiker's Guide theme. It's the only time. <laughs> and then it's okay. <laughs> All right, well, let's go back to the infamous Battle of Alcatraz, because you have notes on the hauntedness there, too. A little bit. All right, so in cell block C, many believe that the utility passageway where convicts Bernard Coy, Joseph Kretzer, and Marvin Hubbard were killed during their escape attempt in Mm -hmm. 1946 is haunted. Loud, clanging noises are often heard but stop when the door is opened, only to resume once closed. Others have reported seeing the apparitions of men wearing fatigues and hearing disembodied voices at the riot site that left the three prisoners dead. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah, in uh, one of the videos I heard, like, they got some really neat EVPs from the area. One of someone saying, like, help me. Uh, <laughs> no. Yeah. <laughs> you shot people. <laughs> Unless you're one of the pris- or one of the guards. In which case, yeah. yes, I'll yeah. help you. <laughs> yeah, who are you? What's your name? But then can you trust it? I know. It's so hard <laughs> these days to trust ghosts. <laughs> so what do you have in your haunted stories? So, uh, the visitation room. Okay. It ha- is home to the most famous ghost picture of Alcatraz and one of the most famous ghost pictures ever, I learned. Okay. And it looks like it is. So like it is. the visitation room is, um, there were like these l- like panels that you sat at with like thick glass in between. With the phone? Yeah. You so them and all the good things. Oh my. Yeah, what there is, is a woman. In the in the glass. I don't like that. <laughs> okay, is that like faked? That's the thing. Like, it looks pretty darn fake to me. Um, but it's one of if you type in like Alcatraz ghost and go on the Google like it visitation pops up. Room, yeah, yeah, visitation room. We should post Even, it to our Facebook. That's your yeah, job. Yeah, and I'll send it to you. You can post it on uh, your Instagram, the oh, Wellhouse Instagram. My Instagram. But. Uh, the watch, they went to Alcatraz and they took a picture at the same spot and they're like, maybe it's a reflection and they could not get a reflection even close to looking like that. Huh, okay. And then someone else posted a picture that they got of the same, like, window Mm -hmm. and there is, like, an obvious hand coming up and grabbing their lanyard. Mm -hmm. That, to me, just looks like a reflection because they're holding, like, you know, they would be holding their phone right in front of their chest where their lanyard would be taking a picture and that's just, just their hand in the window. So that one I don't really believe. But the the woman picture... It's intriguing. It's either photoshopped really well or... Well, how old is the picture? Because um, we want to date ourselves, but, you know, Photoshop wasn't that great a couple years ago. <laughs> so. Yeah. 2014. Okay, so it could have been photoshopped. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah, technology was okay at that point enough that we could do that. That was just 10 years ago then. Yeah. A decades old picture. Anyway, so, what else do we have? Another one is cell 402C. 402C, okay. So, C block. And this is where Joe Kretzer shot William Miller. Mm, okay. And in that cell, one person got a picture. Are those feet? Of feet, yeah. Are those like claw? What are they wearing? Slides? Yeah, it looks like um like, like slippers, shoes, right? Yeah. It, something like that. Safety shoes. <laughs> yeah. So I started searching and I found pictures of these guys. That's a picture of Alcatraz in yeah. in operation, and it looks the shoes are different, but the, the pants, the, the pants white are the pants, same, yeah. are the same. So well, they wouldn't have shoes that nice though on them, would they? Because yeah, I don't know. If you had um, shoe strings, you would hurt somebody. Yeah. So, my other question is, is that just um, uh, a weird artifact of someone walking by and it looks blurry and see-through because of it, yeah. you know? 
So I thought that was an interesting picture of like, it's just these disembodied feet standing one by one inside a cell. Yeah. So I thought that was a really neat one. This one I think is my favorite one I found on US Ghost Adventures. Where uh, it's called the Christmas Alcatraz Ghost. Okay, you know this is that's a story that I told in our first episode, probably right, the one that shows up at Ward the Warden's house. Yeah, you yeah. did tell this one. I don't remember I, that. Did I not? Oh, so you tell it again in case I didn't. In I'm case you didn't, yeah. yeah. Or we have listeners that chime into the third part of a series. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have you. I know you're out there. <laughs> so uh, the basic gist of it is during so Warden Johnston was not a believer. Mm-hmm. At all. He he thought it was all nonsense and silliness. Yep. And then he had a Christmas party <laughs> in his house on the island. I, I still won't, like, living on the island with, with them. Hey, Sure. Uh, so li- it's Christmas Eve, party's going, and all of a sudden the fire goes out. Mm-hmm. And standing in the middle of a crowd is a man in a gray uniform with very, very thick mutton chops. <laughs> <laughs> and... Then he just vanishes into the air as quickly as, you know, the smoke does from the fireplace. Like, what's what's interesting about that is it it shows up by the Ben Franklin stove, which was extinguished. Mm -hmm. It disappears. And people saw that ghost afterward, too. Even when the warden's um, building, house, whatever, burned down, they would still see sightings of this ghost there. And... Attitude, even though Johnston did not believe in ghosts, you know, he actually had heard the sobs of a woman. Yeah. yeah. And so, like, and he was, like, actually leading people, like, on a tour. And the ghosts, the guests, sorry, not the ghosts, the guests, <laughs> and he both heard the the ghost sobbing. Yeah. And then, like, as the sobbing, like, stopped, this icy wind, like, blew through the entire group. But he still, like, refused to believe that ghosts were real until yeah. that Christmas party. Yeah. I mean, yeah, a, a disembodied sobbing, like, you could get from, I don't know, I, I, I would be able to explain that away. Yeah. It's coming from three miles across the water, somehow. <laughs> somehow. Well, any other ghost stories from you? Um, Other than just, like, the random EVP and things. Okay, so, no. There is a... There is a ghost hunting tool that I just call complete oh, yes, and total PJ's pet peeves. BS. There we go, the pet peeves. I hate this thing so much. I don't believe it's a real thing at all. I'm pretty sure it's a scam just to make tons and tons of money off of nerds like okay. us. So Don't lump me in there. I ain't no nerd. We're making a <laughs> podcast about ghosts. <laughs> just just saying. <laughs> I, I prefer paranormal expert. <laughs> So, the most famous one is called the Ovulus. Uh, It's also known as a ghost box. What it does, as explained in The Watch and, like, from ghostshop.com and other places, is it takes several factors from the area, like temperature and the barometer and this and that and the EMF and this and that and the other thing, and it translates them into words. And okay. then it'll spout off words. Like, you know, you're just walking around with this little box and it'll it'll just say, say like, pizza, you know, or like strawberry. Oh, like, and I, is it like what I used when I showed the example of the RMS Queen Mary and that and the... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. How it just like spouts off random yeah, words. Yeah. And they're like, you know, they're like, did you like pizza? You know? <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, I swear that it's not a real thing. It just spouts off words. I don't believe it's a real thing, but they used it. All the time in this video on YouTube. Like, okay. It was their favorite thing in the world. Just walk around. And, and what was it saying? Uh, again, like, stump, dumb things like that. Like, it didn't make any sense. And they were trying to make sense of it. And, you know, like, asking leading questions to try to connect it. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, no, this is not at all. But then they went to um, the showers where two men were stabbed oh, to okay. death. And they put one of the... Uh, uh, one of the other spirit boxes that light up when things get near it, you know? Yeah. And it's around? Yes. That one, yeah. And so they put it on a little shelf, and they're like, is anyone here right now? And it, like, lights up. Ooh, okay. And they're like, oh, wow, that was fast. <laughs> Why? <is laughs> and there? so they start asking some yes or no questions, you know, were you one of the ones who were killed here? You know, are you so-and-so and everything? And uh, they have a little back and forth with that, which is pretty neat, but... All in all, it's a pretty uneventful YouTube video, and it's like an hour long. 
but that makes me find it more credible when it's not bombastic yeah. and crazy. You know, it's like... It's little things that prove that things are there. Yeah, and even the EVP is like, it's because they had something out all night and they caught it the next day. And so you don't, you never hear them react to it. Mm -hmm. It's just like, hey, we caught this. And they, you know, and, and it's played. And I appreciate the honesty of that. You yeah. know, I just, I just hate that spirit box. <laughs> okay. I really hate that thing. Next week on PJ's Pet Peeves. <laughs> Next week, spirit boards. <laughs> Are they bad? <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. So I would like to officially announce our giveaway. Hey! Because we have hit 20,000 downloads. And so therefore it is important for us to get our stuff out there so our picture is going to be posted imminently on our facebook page mm -hmm. and both instagrams all of it yep and so in this giveaway you're going to get from games overboard the board game worm span and the card game awkward turtle you'll also get the um magnet for the car and i will be happy to teach anyone worm span via zoom a one-on-one on one with PJ. That's wow. right. Or I'll just make a video if you're not comfortable with that. I'll just make a video <laughs> how to play. It's from, easy. From Danger and Dice, you're going to get a set of spooky white spooky colored dice. dice. Yep, and they are on top of the box in the on picture. On top of the box. Because they're so pale, they <laughs> kind of like blend in. They get lost in the picture a, a little, little bit. bit. Yeah, a little bit. Um, and then as a combo to go over with Wellhouse Exorcism, there is a tarot deck and it's Dungeons and Dragons themed yep. tarot. And then, of course, from Wellhouse Exorcism, you're going to get a sign that says, Abandon all hope, ye who enter here, of course, from mm -hmm. Dante's Inferno. You're going to get Adopt a Ghost. You're going to get Lobby. Um, also on the box that's kind of hidden because it's clear is a ghost inside a cute little, like, jar. jar and it's glow in the dark, so he's just so cute. You need to see this thing. Either <laughs> go to ghostshop.com because they sell them too, or look at our picture that we posted. I say look at our picture because then you can comment that you want to be in the contest. Yeah. You can zoom in to see it. It's on yeah, just the zoom in. right hand, like, wing, or it's beside the Wellhouse Exorcism um uh, car car magnet. magnet, yeah, it's there. He's so cute. He's it's in... so great, and the ghost is glow in the dark. Yeah, it, it's so great. So, um, I, again, you're gonna get that. You're going to get the adopt a ghost. You're going to get the car magnet, and you're gonna get two pins. One is scary stories to tell in the dark, and the other one is Mothman for president. Oh, and you'll also get the Wellhouse Exorcism pin. Yes. So lots of fun stuff in this giveaway. To thank you guys for increasing and sh uh, you know sharing our podcast, with everybody. The podcast that was never meant to be. I, I know. Will always right? I'm call it. <laughs> so happy that this thing took off. Like I'm so happy and grateful for all of you. We just uh, heard from a new listener. We did. And actually, he's messaging right now. Holy as we talk. cow, right now. Tell yeah. him you're live. <laughs> Tell yeah. him you're being recorded. Uh, Car his name's Carrie. He says, just an FYI, there is a Hex documentary on Tubi. What is Tubi a TV? Oh, Tubi's a free streaming app. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Carrie, we just gave you, we just <laughs> gave you a shout out. Keep all this in. <laughs> LOL. Live. <laughs> I'm texting as I'm talking. <laughs> uh, so thank you, uh, Carrie, for reaching out. It was nice to talk to you and to help you out a little bit. Yeah. Um, if we don't know how to help you with your ghost or other issues, we'll find someone who can help you. We just like talking to humans. Yeah, I'm actually, I have some books lined up that I've been a either reading or I want to read that I'm going to order about witchcraft uh demonology mm -hmm. things like that to like to educate myself because we've got uh, several people emailing us asking for help so i want to make sure that we can provide Don't better make help it worse. no well no like we know when not to yeah you know what if we don't know something, we say, hey, go talk to someone, you yeah. know. But if we do know the answer or do know something that will help, we will suggest it. Mm -hmm. And so that's that's my goal is to be able to help more than than just what we know already. Mm -hmm. And just to, to, you know, to educate myself and better myself in that. And Carrie also said that he likes the stories where 
they're actual like you know ghost stories like real we're telling our own things you know our, our own personal yeah, stories. stories and so because of that Carrie, we have an episode coming for you with our paranormal expert carrie with an ie we're going to be telling uh our night terror stories our deja vu stories and some things that maybe you might consider hauntings we're not sure so we're gonna posit all those stories for our next big episodes they'll be next sunday yeah that's all for you, Carrie. See, we we aim to please <laughs> our <laughs> listeners. Uh, but anyway, thank you all for listening to the Wellhouse Exorcism. Find us on Instagram as Wellhouse Exorcism, mm-hmm. on Twitter X as Wellhouse underscore Exorc, or on Facebook under Games Overboard because we are a subsidiary. Feel free to hop on our website as well, which is gamesoverboard.com. And as always, please email us because we want to hear from you and we will read your texts live on. <laughs> <laughs> and share the word about us, please. Like the we're only gonna get better if we can grow yeah. and it's thanks to you that we have grown this much already in less than two years yeah and if you have been listening and you like it but there's something missing or something that you really want something that we can fix let us know because we'd love to do that <laughs> yeah yeah like our job is you know our goal is for you like yeah. that's why we do this is for you well and for us because we like talking about this stuff but <laughs> we're currently not getting paid for this <laughs> exactly yeah <laughs> we would like to though so you know if you keep sharing the podcast at some point we can monetize <laughs> we're so close <laughs> i keep watching the numbers crying but in any case yeah please uh share your ideas share our podcast yeah. share the love all right and as always think spooky thoughts I found solitary confinement the most forbidding aspect of prison life. There is no end and no beginning. There is only one's mind, which can begin to play tricks. Was that a dream, or did it really happen? One begins to question everything. Nelson Mandela, 